I had a boss tell me once, <clears throat> here's what I want you to accomplish. Here's the, here's the end product. I said, okay, that's fine. Now just tell me what you want me to do. Give me the step by step. He wouldn't do it. He just said, no, no, here, here's how, what I want it to look like. Now, you know, we're way over here at this point, and I'm not going to give you any of the in-between. I am just going to let you figure out how to fill in the blanks. And I thought, that's kind of unfair. I mean, I'm just an employee here. You've got to tell me what I'm supposed to do. But it was a challenge. It turned out to be a good one. Because I had to really think about how I could get from the place that we were to the place where he wanted us to be. And I didn't have just an instruction sheet that I could just follow by rote. And I found myself becoming more invested in the project and more excited about the outcome because of that process. And you know, for, some, for us Christians, some of the time, maybe most of the time, we would just assume that God would give us sort of an instruction sheet. Uh, how to, uh, you know, here's the step-by-step -step manual. Here's what I want you to do today. And so we just pick up this instruction sheet and we just follow the instructions. And then by the end of the day, we'll have accomplished what he wanted and it's all good. But he doesn't do that. Now, some people might say, well, yes, he does, Pastor Tom. It's right here before you. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. Well, the Bible, I don't think, is an instruction sheet for step-by-step -step on how to love God. I think the Bible is more of a telling of God's story of salvation and encouragement for the body of Christ, not so much to just, okay, as long as I do A, B, and C, I'll be in good stead with God. Instead, it teaches us how to fall in love with the Lord. The more we love Him, and as we'll see here in this chapter we're going through, the more we love Him, the more we are known by Him, and His character begins to be sort of downloaded into our hearts. And we don't have the step-by-step -step instructions, but we find we don't need them because we're becoming invested in the kingdom of God. And in the process of us being transformed and in the process of the kingdom of God being shared. And we're just to be become ex more excited about the outcomes that God does through our lives in that way. But it requires something really big of us. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And we're going to go through all of chapter 8. It's only 13 verses long. But it can be very impacting in your life if you let it. Now, there are two things I want to point out before we start through the, the verses here of chapter 8. And again, as we're going through 1 Corinthians, it is lessons in how not to be a Christian. Because so often, uh, we find that the Corinthians were basically doing it wrong. So it's one of those things where, see what I'm doing and do the opposite. That's kind of the idea with 1 Corinthians. And Paul is correcting them at, like at every turn. And they had written Paul a letter and they'd asked him a series of questions. Paul wrote back to him and basically spent the first part of the letter uh, in a scathing rebuke of their immaturity and the arguments that they were having with one another and the, the flesh that was allowed to kind of have first place in their lives. But then he begins answering the questions that they have. And, and today we look at question number two. But the, again, two things that I want to point out before we go through that. Um, and the first is, as believers in Jesus Christ, there are two things that are going on in our lives. And I actually already mentioned them. The first is that we are being transformed into the character of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, or chapter 12, verse 1, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. You can take a look at those for references. And then secondly, that character is being used by God to shine that love story, the gospel of Jesus Christ, out into a dark world. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors. We are representatives of the kingdom of God in this very, very dark world. And everything we do, everything we think, and everything we say ought to have those two things in mind. As Paul said back in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So the second thing really comes out of Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8 verse 2 where he said, Because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. This is a very, very important concept for us as Christians to understand. We are free. No longer are we under a set of rules and regulations. That only leads to death. It only leads to show us how unable we are to follow God's law and to be like Him. 
And we have been set free from that through the spirit of life. In other words, God came and took away the death that was reigning in us and instead gave us His eternal life. So we are no longer under the law. We say, hallelujah. I guess I can just go do whatever I want, huh? And the point is, the freedom that we have in Christ doesn't mean we just have carte blanche to do anything given the reality of the first point that I made, and that is we are being transformed into the character of Jesus Christ. Now take a look back, hold your place in chapter 8, and, and look back to chapter 6, because we saw a really key verse there. Maybe one of the, mo the, the most uh, important verses in this ch uh, book. Chapter 6, verse 12. Where Paul says... Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Or another translation says beneficial. Now this is something we can actually apply to our lives. That not everything that we could choose to do in this new freedom will help our relationship with Christ being transformed into His character. Though it might technically be permissible for you to do because you're no longer under the law. So in chapter 8, we can apply this same principle, not just to the choices that we make, but our interactions with other people as well in this culture. And Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5, he said, You are called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. And this includes the way that we treat other people who are not necessarily as far along in their understanding of the freedoms that we have in Christ. And so that's basically what chapter 8 is all about. So as we read it, as we go through this, think about the freedoms that we have in Christ. Ability to be an ambassador, an example to a world who doesn't know Christ, and to young people, young believers, immature believers, who are just deciding whether it's a Jewish one. About food offered to idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge inflates with pride, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. About eating food offered to idols, then, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are, are all things, and we through him. So I know that most of the time when we read this, as soon as we read about food offered to idols, there's this little thing that happens in our brain that says, click off, I'm just going to think about something else now because this doesn't apply to me. I don't know about you, but when I look around the streets of Newburgh, I have not yet found a pagan idol. I've not seen anyone carrying the carcasses of, uh, you know, cattle or, or rams or bulls or anything in there and sacrifice. You know, I don't know about you. Have you guys seen any of that? I haven't either. And we think, okay, well, I'll move on then. That's just one of those things in antiquity, one of those deals that doesn't really apply today anymore. And I know you know where I'm going with this. The truth is it actually does apply, I think, in a very, very important way. But first let's look at the culture of Corinth. Corinth was idol central. And they had temples and they had idols just everywhere. They were dime a dozen. And part of the worship of those idols were, uh, who were actually false gods was in animal sacrifice. And so they would take animals, they would sacrifice them to these idols, and then either that would be consumed in the temple as part of their worship, or basically they'd take it down to Safeway and that would be the, this week's ribeye special, you know? <laughs> and so you, you couldn't just go down to your lo local supermarket and, and pick up, you know, a, 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 a nice juicy T-bone without it being, having had been offered to an idol. 
Um, and so the Corinthians were basically of the opinion, as they wrote to Paul here, that since they no longer partook in any of these pagan ritual practices anymore, and since they were indeed free from the law of sin and death and had been granted freedom in Christ, uh, that they could basically eat this idle sacrificed meat without any problems. And, and they you know, said, we have all knowledge. You know, we're smarter now. We know these idols aren't anything. These gods aren't really anything. And it's like they were setting this argument up to Paul about eating meat sacrificed to idols. And they say, we can do it. No problem whatsoever. And here's why. And um, in, on the face of it, it's actually a sound argument. You know, he says that um, they are so-called gods, uh, but in reality there's only one God. These, these pagan gods weren't really gods. What they were were fronts for demons. And so in reality the people were worshiping demons when they were doing this. They weren't really real gods at all. So if on the face that they are correct, then what's Paul's answer going to be to them? The, the, the thing here is that they needed, to be, they needed to go beyond the legality of eating pagan sacrificed meat to the expedience of doing so in the sight of others, the effect of their actions as others saw them. So he is basically appealing the Corinthians to go beyond themselves, or as we might say in the popular vernacular, get over yourself. <laughs> there's something more important going on here. And there's this great tendency, I know, as we we learn about the Lord, and, and I applaud you guys for being here to study God's Word verse by verse. It's the best thing that you can do. Sometimes when we gather a lot of knowledge about the Lord and about His Word and about what He's like, um, we can have a tendency to start putting ourselves over other people a little bit. And the truth of the matter is, the more that we know God and are known by Him, the more we get His heart, like I said, kind of downloaded into our souls. And that's not a heart that says, you know, I'm pretty special because I know a lot of stuff that you don't. <laughs> but it's the kind of heart that says, I'm going to use my knowledge to find a way to reach out in love even if it means personal sacrifice. So that's really the hallmark of a maturing believer. When, when you love God, God knows you. You begin to share His love-giving character. Now, verse 6, I don't know about in your Bible, in the, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it's kind of set off as if it's a quotation from maybe a hymn, maybe a poem that uh, was going on at the time. Um, and it's true, and is among the most incredible things that you can learn, that despite all the gods in the world, there's really only one God and there's really only one Lord. But people don't practice that way. We'll talk more about that here in just a second. And you know, we can sum it up this way. It's all about Jesus. You know, every page of the Old Testament looks forward to His coming. Every page of the New looks back to what He has done and forward to the coming of His kingdom. It's really all about Him. The problem is... Not everybody knows this yet. Not everybody believes it yet. And especially those who are just beginning to process the claims found in those pages of the Old and New Testament. Well, they've recently come to faith in Jesus and they really don't know much of anything else. I don't know about you, but I didn't attend seminary before I became a Christian. I didn't have much of an understanding of the things of God, even though I attended church for most of my life. It wasn't really till afterwards. And it's during that very beginning period of time where the, the Christian is the most vulnerable. Um, and that's when, in fact, you may know this, but, but uh, the cults, uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and others, they will, they will especially prey on those who have just decided to give their faith, to uh, put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ because they're so vulnerable to being pulled off. Oh, you really want to be a Christian. We've got some knowledge that you need to know. And then off they go into one of these um, cults. And so that's what Paul is going to address here. He says, yeah, you know, it's true, you're right. It's only one God, and these, you know, meat sacrificed to an idol is not sacrificed to anything, really. There's no other God. 
But as Paul Harvey, the late Paul Harvey might have said, and now the rest of the story. He says in verse 7, not everyone has this knowledge. In fact, some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food offered to an idol, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not make us acceptable to God, and we are not inferior if we don't eat. So, you know, eat, don't eat, I don't care. But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. And if anything, that's the key verse of this chapter. For if somebody sees you, the one who has this knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? Then the weak person, the brother for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Wow. Okay, so let's run through this a little bit. First of all, Paul says not everybody is as far along in their understanding and in their maturity in Christ as you are. Now, think about it. When you first came to Christ, you couldn't just wade right back into the areas of the world and the fallen culture that you worshipped. It would have really, really hurt you in your ability to really put your faith down in Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about the idea that their conscience is defiled, and, it's, and it, the idea there in the Greek is to soil. It's like throwing dirt at a clean shirt. Though it's true that as mature Christians, we have the freedom to do many things. We need to make sure that what we are free to do doesn't cause someone else to stumble. And that word there is, uh, it's the word stub, as in stubbing your toe. And the idea is that you are, you would trip over it. Their consciences can't yet handle the ideas of the freedom that we have in Christ. So Paul goes on, he says, if you continue to flaunt your freedom, it might actually cause them to think that worshiping the old idol gods must be okay. Well, you know, Brother Joe... I better use a different name. Uh, sorry, Joe. Uh, <coughs> no, Brother Ed, thank you. I can use one of our elders' names here, and, and he won't mind. You know, well, Brother Ed's over here. You know, he bought that big old... Uh, that big old New York cut steak over here at the Idol Temple and he's barbecuing it out there in front. Well, I guess if that's the case, then maybe this whole thing about the Lord God being the, being the only God must, must not really be true. Maybe those idols are something after all, because if Ed's doing it, it must be okay. It must be right. And so he finds himself going back to the idol worship once again. And he never settles into Christ. He never firmly puts his weight down. He's like in this period where there's, there's like a a choice being made. The more I go on in Christ, the more I think that, you know, we, we, like, to, we like to think that there's like this decision point where you, uh, it's like this, you know, you can't ever go back, you know, I'm a Christian now and that's it. And um, I think that as people really consider the gospel, there's more this point at which they're really trying to decide. And they might think, yeah, I think maybe I am a Christian, but I'm not totally sure yet. And that's the period that's really, really dangerous. That's the time at which they can really be influenced by um, something like this. So let's finish off the chapter here in verse 12 and 13. He says, or verse 11, When the weak person, the brother for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now when you sin like this against the brothers and, wound, uh, and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to fall, I will never again eat meat, so that I won't cause my brother to fall. Wow, pretty strong words. Well, Paul's basically saying that the gospel comes before my personal freedom. Now, I'm sure Paul did not become a vegetarian for life in all situations and in all circumstances, but when, when immature brothers and sisters who would be pulled, uh, pulled aside by these practices of eating meat, because you, you really couldn't eat meat in that culture that hadn't been sacrificed to idols. Uh, you know, they didn't have little markets that said, this meat not on the label, you know, this meat not sacrificed to idols, kind of like organic food or something like we have today. <laughs> Thank you. 
And lest we think this is just a light thing, when Paul talks about sin in this chapter, the only sin he's talking about is the person who flaunts their knowledge so that a, an immature believer or a person who is considering Christ stumbles or falls. Wow. When salvation is at stake, things get serious. Being a Christian is not necessarily all that light of a thing. It's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's the thing. But it's not to be taken lightly. Again, I go back to what I said at the beginning. We're here to be transformed into His character and then reflect that character out into a dark world so that the other people will come to know Jesus Christ and experience the eternal life that He has given to us. So how can we apply this today other than avoiding eating meat at idols, idol temples? Won't, won't be a problem around here. But the value here for us is that we need to uh, juxtapose our freedom with the effectiveness in the go of the gospel in the lives of other people. For the people in Corinth, you know, they had obvious pagan gods or idols that they worshipped instead of the one true living God. So for them, anything that would uh, that led them to think that still worshipping an idol was okay would stand in the way of the gospel. Though perhaps permissible, for the Christian who knows that the idols really aren't anything, so there's no big deal. You eat meat, you don't eat meat, whatever. You know? <laughs> okay, so if we don't have any idol temples around here, do we have any idols in this culture that we worship? Yes. Oh, yes, we do. Money, power, beauty, physical prowess, knowledge, food, possessions, the list goes on and on. Make no mistake, these are gods that people worship. And so what we need to look at is, number one, okay, who's around us? Who are we influencing right now? Who's looking at our lives? And then two, what are the activities we're engaged in that might jeopardize that person's walk with Jesus Christ? It's not about the law and right and wrong, well, it is about right and wrong. You know, again, the first thing is we need to do things that are within the character of Christ, but there's so much that's permissible. Everything is permissible, although not everything is beneficial. But if I'm sharing the gospel with a pre-Christian or a young believer who, let's say the person has worshipped the god Mammon, money, <coughs> Maybe in the form of gambling. They've had a problem with gambling and they just they love money so much that they just haven't been able to break free of that. And then they become a Christian or they're really considering the gospel of Jesus Christ going, man, you mean this can set me free from these things that have so uh, plagued me in the past? So we say, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad that you're going to come forward and accept Christ. Let's go celebrate. Let's go on out to the casino and have dinner and then, you know, have a few rounds of blackjack. See where I'm going? Now, I could do that as a Christian. Not that I would, but I could. But am I putting the needs of... putting my needs first? My freedoms first? Or the needs of the gospel in my friend's life first, as more important than my freedom. I do not want this per person to think that worshiping the God of money is okay, because it isn't. There's only one God, and anything that comes between you and the one true God is an idol. Now, this person isn't going to be mature enough to realize that I am free in Christ. As long as I am reflecting the character of Christ in my life, I'm good. I'm good to go. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. We need to be careful with those around us who do not yet understand the freedoms that we have in Christ. Maybe it's, uh, you know, in another person's life, maybe it's alcohol. Uh, Maybe it's dancing. Maybe it's, maybe it's exercise. Maybe, you know, Paul might have said, I will never work out again in front of my brother if it means my brother will stumble over the God of physical prowess. 
Now, a second and I think really important point for us to consider here is that we're not talking about just differences in style between maturing believers in Jesus Christ. Nor do I think that Paul is giving us universal prohibitions about things like eating meat. Paul is not saying, thou shalt be a vegetarian from this. Is he? I don't think that he is. But if you're in the presence of somebody who's deciding to put their faith in Christ, and you flaunt a freedom that just won't understand at this point, then that's on you. Eesh. But between Christians who are maturing and have an understanding of God's Word, then I think that um, it's more just up to interpretation and um, how you want to lead your, your walk with Christ. And sometimes I think Christians get into these intramural battles over style. And a couple of the things that I mentioned have been the subject of those debates in the past. Things like dancing. Even to this day, uh, you, if, it, and I think I've actually used this analogy before, but uh, Margaret and I have taken uh, some ballroom. We really enjoy dancing together, but if we were to come into a fellowship of believers who really believed that dancing was, you know, against uh, God's law, and we started, we threw on a waltz, and we started waltzing around, and hopefully didn't trip or anything, uh, that would really offend them. Uh, but it ought not to. If we are maturing believers, that if I'm going to a place where uh, they worship the God of dance, could there be such a thing? I don't know. And, I, and we start doing that and they go, oh, well, I guess it's okay. Then, then maybe this Jesus thing isn't all it's cracked up to be. That would be wrong. It's not an instruction manual, is it? It's like, well, well, if I can do it here, how come I can't do it here? I just need to know, God, tell me. He says, no, no, here's the outcome. Here's the end of the project. I want your life to so shine before men that they will see you and give glory to me. That they'll see you and go, man, that Jesus is something else. I want to love him. Now, however you do that, it's up to you. But that's the goal. And we go, God, that's not fair. What does it do? It forces us to dig into His Word and learn of His character. It forces us to go, I better really come to an understanding of what God is doing in my heart. It, it forces us to think when we're out amongst other people, how am I coming across? Knowing that other person and what problems that they might be facing. So we're talking about salvation, not style. This is important stuff. We're talking about freedoms within the character of Christ. We're talking about putting someone else's salvation above our freedoms in Christ. And we're talking about love being the primary motivator in our lives. As we grow more mature, we find it, it is less about us and more about God, what God can do through us for other people. It's all about this character of being other-centered. That's the Lord. It's like what Paul wrote when he said, consider the needs of others more, consider others as more significant than yourself. It doesn't mean that I'm really bad and you're really good. That's not what he's talking about at all. But what he's talking about is that this is a life and death, death situation. People's eternities are at stake. God would go to any length in order to rescue people from an eternity of separation to Him. It's that bad. And He would go to any length. He will give up anything in order to reach those people and pull them into His eternal life and love, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we ought to be like that as well. So pray for discernment to know, am I in a situation where something I'm doing here is going to offend somebody who is uh, an immature believer or just coming to Christ so badly that they're going to decide to walk away from the Lord? And if so, I just won't do it. They are worth more than my freedom. Let's pray. Lord, these are difficult things to grasp. And, and I, I pray, Lord, that as we go our way today, that you would begin to apply to our own lives as to understand this message all to the Corinthians uh, as it is applied to us today. Lord, I know that what you want us to do is to reflect your character. And so help us to know how to most effectively do that. You gave up your life, Lord. You gave up your freedom. You gave up everything so that we could 
have eternal life with you. Help us, Lord, to know when, where, and what we need to give up in order to bring more people to know you. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.